Hello and welcome to our webinar, What is Digital Marketing? So we're going to jump right into the, uh, right into the presentation here uh, with a quick introduction of myself and Adam. So my name is Paul Dorfling and I'm the Marquee Product Manager and other than doing uh, product marketing like this webinar, I'm also responsible for uh, bringing new ideas into the company and into our R&D program to help develop and extend uh, our product line. I'm Adam Koble. I'm the Manager of Digital Services here at Marquee, uh, which means I'm responsible first and foremost for our onboarding process, so education and training for all of our new clients and for their users in Marquee, as well as uh, oversight of strategic planning and campaign execution for our customers. Great. With that, we'll jump right into the right into the webinar. So we'll start with the agenda. Uh, we're going to take a uh, first look at traditional versus digital marketing. What are some of the differences and similarities? Um, we're going to take a look at what is digital marketing in general for those of you who might be new to it, and then we're going to take a deeper dive into how digital marketing actually works, some of the tools and techniques used in the digital marketing space. So let's start with the traditional channels. Uh, those of you are probably familiar with print, radio, and TV. Uh, but what do we know about these channels? Um, a little few statistics here. Uh, television, only 18% of ads actually generate positive ROI. And 90% of people who can skip ads do. Uh, if you're like me and like everybody else I know, uh, a commercial is something to flip past using your PVR, um, or uh, you do a little channel surfing, or maybe you go and grab a snack from the fridge. Uh, with radio, what we know is that it's got a declining audience and it's down 2% from last year. Uh, the one thing about radio is most people listen to it in their cars, and you can't act on the marketing messaging in the moment that you hear it. So radio has a, a kind of an inherent disadvantage. Uh, newspapers have plummeting circulation. Um, this has been going on for years and it's just getting worse. And of course your ads only live for a single day before they become uh, recycling or lining the bottom of the birdcage. Uh, magazines Still useful, still a good channel, but they're quite costly, and because they require a six to 12 week lead time, they're not exactly an agile method for getting your um, current marketing initiatives uh, in, into, uh, into field. Now in contrast, we've got the digital channels, web, email, social, uh, and for those, and of course we're all familiar with these uh, in our data to use, but here's a few stats. Uh, the web, web content generates three times as many leads as traditional marketing and can cost up to 62% less. I mean, the web is essentially um, an electronic freebie. You can use it, it's great. Uh, email, average delivery rates, people don't realize that they're as high as 96%, and the average open rate is almost 30%. Uh, with a click-through rate of 4.5. Uh, email is a fantastic way. People read it, and if they're interested in the message, they act on it. Uh, social media, a lot of people think it's still for, uh, for kids, but it's not. 72% of adult internet users in the U.S. are active on at least one social network, and this is up from 67% in 2012, and just 8% in 2005. Social media is everybody, and you should probably be in this space too. So digital marketing, just to start at the, the very most basic levels, um, you know, it's it's known by a, a number of, of different terms. Some people call it online marketing. Uh, you'll hear it referred to by its specific delivery channels, so uh, web marketing, email marketing, social marketing. Uh, it's just like any other discipline uh, of marketing. It's a, a means to impart your brand, your messaging to your customers, your potential customers, your leads, depending on your, your business model, and uh, provide them with an offering that you can then use to, uh, to build towards that sales process. It's a qualification process, just like any other marketing discipline. Um, but with digital marketing, it's... It's divided into sort of three major strengths, major components of, of the way that it, it functions as a discipline. Uh, it's technology delivered. So what this means is that the, the various channels that we use to deliver a digital marketing message are going to vary really heavily. And the way that we communicate using those channels has to vary accordingly. Um, each channel has its own specific strengths, and you can implement them alone to significant effect or together as part of a larger digital marketing strategy creating this sort of multi-channel environment. Uh, email, web, social, some other limited web channels, um, they all work together to form a digital marketing ecosystem, and each one is driven by the technology that's used to, to process it. And, you know, more than, more than traditional media, and especially sort of recently, digital marketing has become about the relationship. So, you know, in, in the traditional space, you're imparting a message the same way a mailman delivers a letter. You know, you're, you're taking your content, you're sending it out into the world, and 
hopefully it'll lead to a sale, but the, the process between the two is uh, murky. Um, but with digital media, it's more about a conversation. It's about engaging your leads, your customers, in a, a back and forth, a collaboration internally, a process of informational flow. Um, with digital marketing, we're, we're cultivating the relationship as much as we are building the message. And then on the marketer side, you know, the, the big advantage of digital marketing is that it's, it's, it's got a built-in ROI. It's, it's analytical, the data is there, and it's what drives the, the value of digital marketing. You know, there's no, there's no guesswork uh, involved. You can know right away from the, the second that you publish content in whatever venue, you can find out exactly how many people are viewing that content, how many people are performing your calls to action. There's no, there's no question that's unanswered in digital marketing. The, the question marks all kind of vanish. Provided you're willing to experiment, you know, you're willing to test your hypothesis, and take the time that's required to examine your campaign results. You know, if you if you never take that time, you're not willing to look at the the data that's available. You're never going to learn anything. So there's there's a lot of data out there, and with digital marketing, you're able to take the guesswork out of your next step. It's a, a cycle of uh, of build, deliver, communicate, and respond. So let's let's take a little bit of a closer look at the web. So as a, as a marketing platform, the web is usually the first place that an organization that's new to digital marketing is going to turn. And you know, usually this is for good reason. Your website should act as the hub for all the digital marketing that you're doing. Um, it's host to your most basic content. It's the place people will find you uh, when they're just casually looking. Um, sometimes if, you're, if your search engine optimization is good, they're going to find you when they're not even looking for you. Um, and the web, you can think of it as the, the sort of first conversation. It's the, it's the handshake with your, your prospective customer. So above and beyond your usual kind of brochure style content, your website's where you're going to keep things like landing pages, which are an integral part of any campaign, no matter how many channels that you're running, and, and is a huge component of web marketing. The, the landing page is, is where all the action happens. And then depending on your business, your website might act as a, a literal storefront uh, as well. So you know, keep in mind your audience. You know, is, is your website for customers? Is it for investors? Is it both? Do you have multiple websites? When you're creating your content, and consider the user experience. You know, is it easy to get your visitors to where you want them to go? Um, a good content management system is going to help you build that that perfect site. And um, Paul Paul will tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. Uh, for right now, I want to talk about fluid content. So you know what I what I say when I refer to fluid content is, you know, we're referring to the, this advantage that the web has as a, as a marketer that really you know, you're only going to get from digital content. So think, think for a second about maybe like a traditional piece of media, a brochure, a postcard. You're going to print several thousand copies of it for a trade show, for handing out, or a mail out, and, and what do you got? So you got something that looks nice. You know, ostensibly, you've got the budget for it. You spend a bunch of money on, on design and print, and you've got a physical artifact that's going to work for you, but it's so permanent. You know, you can't change it without having to redo that whole process and spend all that money again. On the web, you're able to apply changes instantly, right? If, if something isn't true anymore about your business or the way you want to market it, it doesn't matter. You can change it. You can go into your content management system, you can make that change, and you're never stuck with what you've built. Flexibility is what makes the web such a powerful core tool for, uh, for marketers. You never have to stay satisfied, right? It's a constant drive for better. Um, your content never goes stale. You can personalize. You can localize your message. You can build pages that appeal specifically to your audience. And if your audience changes, you can change your content too. You know, what you want is a website that feels like it's speaking directly to your visitor and that the message resonates personally for them. Fluid content uh, is going to allow you to keep up with that. You know, as your strategy changes, as your intent for your website changes, you're able to adapt with it and not have to spend your whole budget over again. Another advantage that the web has, uh, you know, and I, I talked a little bit about this in the intro slide, uh, over traditional media is interactivity, right? Traditional marketing is a, it's a one-way street. I send you a postcard, you read it, maybe that's the end of the line. I make a TV ad, you watch it, maybe you remember my product later. I put a spot on the radio, you hear it in your car, and if I'm really lucky, you know, by the time you get out of the car, it's still in your head and you perform whatever my call to action was. But none of that stuff, none of that 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 built-in uh, straitjacketing is true on the web, right? On the web, it's about engagement. So 
when you post content to your website, there are tools available that allow your visitors to engage with that content from something as simple as uh, you know a web form, you know that's that's one on one sort of digital marketing, all the way up to social media integration tools, the ability to uh, email or share your content, and build a, a much broader base than just visitors to your website, right? And and what's going to drive that interactivity? What's going to drive that? importance of content, that sharing, uh, is that your content is relevant, right? And, and that's why that fluid content is going to allow you, you can maintain relevancy, you can stay top of mind, and that every time someone visits your website, they're going to get uh, the, a new, better experience than the, the time they visited before. And those experiences, you know, really go back to the core concepts of marketing as a discipline in that word of mouth marketing is huge. And this is true, especially now, uh, of the web. So, you know, visitors can engage your content, build it to be engaged with, uh, build it for sharing, get your customers involved in your brand, because involvement ultimately means conversion, whether for those customers or for their, their audience. You know, everybody's a content creator, and you want to engage them that way. So let's talk a little bit about the, the call to action. This might be the, the sort of ultimate element of, of digital marketing, um, from a marketer's perspective at least. You know, whether it's, it's a click here to learn more button or it's a contact us link, um, you know, on, on your, your email, whatever the form that it takes, this call to action takes, it's the part of your digital marketing effort that uh, allows you to turn basic information into engagement. It's where digital media starts to shine. So, you know, your audience can answer for themselves that question of, well, so what, right? I, I, you, I've learned my message. So what now? Um, and the, the call to action says, you know, now that you've heard what we have to say, it's time to do something about it. And that process is what we call conversion. So it might be a sign up, it might be a sale, uh, volunteering more information for future campaigns for personalization. Whatever it is, it's a tailorable behavior. It's a way to get what you need from your site visitors. So one thing that the web can do that, that human marketers you know, unless they're incredibly dedicated, uh, can't, is provide that content, provide that information all the time. So, I mean, if you're, if you're viewing this webinar, ostensibly you're a human being, um, and, you know, you and your team are all people with schedules. You, you have families and, and need to eat food and to sleep. Even, like, worldwide organizations, globe-spanning organizations have times when they're more or less available to customers, clients, or leads. You can't always answer the phone or respond to your email, but the web is not a person. The, the web is an always-on, always-ready marketing machine. You know, you can engage your visitors with content no matter what schedule they're on. Using the web is a, a really great way to answer, you know, common questions, deal with customer support issues, offer commonly requested information, provide marketing resources, things like webinar recordings, for example, or white papers. Um, all of that stuff can be done on your customer schedule without dedicating any additional person hours to the effort. You know, you're letting your users engage with your brand on their own time, at their own pace, and all of that analytics data is still there. So when you come into the office Monday morning, you can see what campaigns are doing what at what times of day. So this, this always on concept is, is hugely valuable uh, if, if in the past you've been tied to a traditional marketing schedule. Experimentation and analytics on the web allow you to, to really engage with the, the sort of lifeblood of web content. When you print an ad in a, a newspaper, like, like I mentioned, you're kind of stuck with it, right? You might as well carve that message in stone and put it on your front lawn and hope someone sees it. The internet, though, is, is a very fluid entity. If you have a campaign that isn't converting, change it. Right? You have that data at your fingertips. You get a web page nobody's visiting, trash it. Build a new one. If you have a theory about you know, what product or service is your customer's favorite, we'll use the web to prove that theory. Using any number of available analytics tools, you can get hard data to back up those experiments. And with a little bit of time and effort, you're going to know so much more about your brand than you ever did before you started to use the web as a marketing platform. The thing is, is that because, you know, as Paul mentioned, the web is essentially, once you get up and running, it's essentially free. Your failures cost nothing, you know? Pick a theory, pick a hypothesis, test it out. If it doesn't work, as long as you're willing to learn from those, those 
quote unquote failures, it doesn't matter. You can move on. You can start your next marketing experiment so much more informed than you ever were before. So willingness to fail, experimentation and analytics, huge, huge aspects of web marketing. And on top of all of that stuff, you know, no, it's, it's important to recognize that, that no marketer is, is an island. Nobody works alone. You know, we have directors, and we have brand managers, we have partners and VPs and CEOs to contend with, and everybody has their own idea of what marketing content should look like, especially when it comes to, to building and deploying that content to an audience. And so, you know, not only that, but if you're working as part of an organization that has a larger network of brands, so you're part of a franchise or you have a head office that's managing a bunch of different brands and you're responsible for one of them, you got to be sensitive to brand policy and, and head office mandated content. And, you know, just like regular web content, the right CMS, the right content management system is going to allow you to combine the creativity and, and energy of the human element using things like permission and workflow controls as well as content administration tools and then the content itself by way of aggregation and, and inclusion rules so you know the the nirvana of web content is this this space where every member of the content creation process has exactly the right level of access and control for their responsibility there should never be a question on the web of, of who's responsible for what you know once you build that framework you're going to be able to perform experiments learn from your content then everyone is going to be able to experiment within their own sphere without worrying about you know damaging the content of, of other folks you know you're, you're able to create a space for your marketing team to take safe risks and make you know leaps forward for your uh, for your conversion, right? So it's it's this combination of freedom to to do what needs to get done quickly and easily with that fluidity of content, and then control to make sure that everyone is is marching to the same the same beat, right? We're all going in the same direction, working as a team, and there's there's technology available uh, that that can help you with that. So I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, about email marketing. Um, so what what you're looking at right now, this is this is just a real like very focused example of, of one path that a, a email marketing might take. Um, this is actually ours. Uh, I built this to to follow up on signups for uh, for our webinars. So you can see it. You know, it has some some web content. Uh, it has some live follow ups. Has some emails built in, and. You know, I really just wanted to show you this to, to prove a point, right? That, that email marketing used to be just like direct mail. You know, back in, back in the proverbial stone age of the internet, email marketing was all about the blast email. You know, you build a list, you, you assemble your, your recipient segment, maybe you do a mail merge for a little bit of basic personalization and away you go, right? It's a one-off. But email marketing today is a, a much more complex beast. You know, you can still do that old blast style email, um, but that kind of program, that kind of email campaign should really be the beginning, not the end of a much bigger infrastructure of communication, of content. Um, automated drip campaigns, multiple follow-up paths, conversion protocols, uh, behavioral scoring, all of that stuff makes email marketing a lot more like a choose your own adventure than a postcard. So while we're on the on the subject of email, um, I'm just going to turn it back over to Paul for some some numbers. Thanks, Adam. So, again, a few more stats about uh, about email. More than half of adults say they would likely open an email containing promotions and coupons, and 30% said they would forward such an email to others. Now, can you imagine if you if your print or your radio ads were that effective? that people would actually pass them on to their friends and neighbors and people who are relevant customers because these people will self-select that customer base for you of people who they think are interested. An absolutely fantastic uh, benefit of email. Now, 84% of consumers surveyed reported clicking through on relevant email offers, and this is key. People don't click through on spam. They don't click through on things that aren't relevant to them. And this is where kind of advanced subscriber management and things come into play. So you're always making sure that you're sending the right message. 73% of people said they've made an online purchase as a result of receiving an email offer. So this means they've actually acted on something they've received through email. It's not imaginary. People actually do this kind of work. And 86% of consumers have made an in-store purchase as a result of receiving an email. Sometimes it's hard to connect that email to an actual in-store purchase, but the fact is people do this and email is incredibly effective. So if 
you know, if the if the stats haven't haven't wooed you to, to email, if you're not already looking into an email marketing provider, uh, let me let me help you along. So we have a there's a there's a concept, uh, the the process of, of relationship building with email recipients, and to a lesser extent, uh, you know, web and and to some ways social. We call we call that process engagement engineering. And you know, when I use that term, I talk about engaging customers. I talk about engineering that engagement. This is what I mean. So it's, a, it's sort of a three-step process. The first stage is communication. So this is just the real basic stuff. Uh, you have a message. You want to impart it clearly and efficiently to the right audience. That's the most important place to start. You know, effective communication is putting the right words, image, and user experience in the inbox of the right people. Um, you know, you can you can see effective uses of this in the B2C space where if I buy a product, I'm going to get information about that product and subsequent products. Um, you know, you want to think about localization, personalization, uh, and then both inherent uh, and and explicit um, information that you're gathering about your your recipients. Um, it's it's no longer valid to just blast out to everybody and, and hope you get something back. So once that once that message is there, the real power of email marketing starts to kick in. This is that engagement part that we're trying to engineer. You know, we, we've explained to the recipients of our content what the message is. Engagement comes from why. The strongest tool, you know, and I'm, I'm going to keep hammering this into your head, the strongest tool for building engagement is personalized content. And we'll talk specifically a little bit more. I'll give you some more details about that on a, on a later slide. And then lastly, you know, because email isn't a one-way street, we want to give the readers an action to take. Now, you remember what I said about call, calls to action? This is an opportunity to share that content broaden the messages market or convert on an offer, usually directing the recipient to your website or a specifically created landing page for this campaign. So you're going to trade them something, uh, you know, a, a discount, an offering, more content, a demo for their marketing information. So for qualification of, of their information as leads or further sharpening their understanding of them as clients so that the next phase in that choose your own adventure is more personalized, more localized, more targeted, and more effective, right? So. You know, something that can help you engage your your recipients is timing, right? And, and this is an advantage that email has over over print uh, dramatically. So, like like the web, you know, email is not tied to a specific uh, schedule. You're going to hear, you know, over and over from everybody that there's a perfect time to send email, some holy grail moment that means you're going to get a hundred percent read rate. But you know, obviously, that's a myth. People read their email at different times. Everybody interacts with communication differently, especially with the advent of mobile as a, an email platform. It's it's overtaking desktop email in in leaps and bounds. So you're never going to be able to control when someone reads your mail, but. What you can do is control when that email arrives, right? You can make sure that if you've got a, a big event on Saturday, that you've, all your mail is sent by Friday afternoon, even if you're working on it Friday morning, and email is instantaneous. You can match content up with events, promotions, or specific audience localizations, so time zones, for example, really easily, uh, provided you're using an email marketing tool that supports that kind of initiative. So you know, pair that up with a detailed analytics suite, and you're going to be able to know you know, not guess when the best time to send your specific messaging to your specific audience is. So no more of this, you know, Tuesday at 10 a.m., no matter what it is, it's this segment gets mail at this time, that segment gets mail at that time, and you're going to know right away what that best time is for you. Mail Merge 101, you know, in, informs us the absolute least thing we can do is include some kind of personalization in our content. You know, that, that dear first name is the really the starting place, the jumping off point to plan personalization of communication. It's taking the information that you know about your subscribers and leveraging it, right? And it's, it's also using that information to fulfill the promise that you've made to your recipients when they signed up, right? If someone signs up for your newsletter, that more and more is a, a message of trust that's saying, you know, I'm Adam, I live in Vancouver, I'm interested in products A, B, and C. Please reward my giving you that information with valid content. So personalization allows you to really wow your recipients and, and to go further, to build content around what you know about them. And again, a, a solid email marketing tool is going to let you do that. You can customize not just basic stuff like text, but images, offers, your calls to action. The, the conversion paths all around specific categories of information. And because email is so inexpensive and the content is so remarkably flexible, you can send bursts of a highly targeted personalized content to all kinds of small groups. 
The key thing to remember here is that segmentation, personalization are a really good way to make content feel relevant. And again, and if you've been listening, you know this is coming, relevant content converts, period. So all of this stuff, you know, email, blogging, social media, print marketing, multi-channel campaigning allows you to use your website as the core recipient of all of this traffic, but whether you're integrating traditional campaigns, you're just trying to funnel social media conversions, you're doing content marketing on your blog, a tool that's gonna help you track and analyze each channel independently, and then also as part of that larger ecosystem is gonna be invaluable, especially if you wanna add channels as your business grows. If you buy a, a content management system that focuses completely on blogging right now and has no ability to expand into multi-channel of any kind, you're stuck with that blogging tool and you're gonna have to engage another vendor, you're gonna have to go through the whole buying process again. So. You don't have to jump into the into the digital marketing space with both feet. You know, you can test the waters, but make sure that, that the pool you're testing is gonna be big enough for your ambition as you as you fill it. So think about where you might want to go with digital marketing. Think about channels that feel intriguing to you or that might work for your business. And when you go in to buy a tool, when you go to look at a tool for something like that, think about those those potential areas for growth. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn you back over to Paul for a little bit, and he's gonna tell you some more about the tools that might be available to you, and how you can make an informed decision about picking one for your your digital marketing needs. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Adam. So, um, what do you need to make all of this stuff happen? Because we've been talking a lot about uh, about getting these campaigns up and running, but what do you need? So. First, you want to talk to your customer through their preferred channel, so when customers want, how they want it, and wherever they are. So the way, the way that you do this is through uh, a couple of different tools. The first is a content management system. Second is a marketing automation tool or email delivery system. And the third, depending on your business, you may need a, a CRM platform, so customer relationship management. And obviously, if you're in the social media space, a social media tool set. So for those of you who may not be familiar, what is a CMS? So content management systems empower you to create, edit, publish content to your website anytime, anywhere. You can share content between uh, different users because the system is online and always available. Control, it also gives you control over who can add or edit content to your websites or uh, web properties. And you can add new franchise uh, or uh, location-based sites extremely quickly. Uh, and the way that this does this is through, uh, in, our, in our case, uh, an online or software as a service content management system. Really what a content management system allows you to do is take control. You don't have to worry about agency timelines dictating when you can add content, going to outside contractors um, every time you need a site update. The, the real power of a CMS is that it brings the tool into your organization and gives the marketer control over how, when, and where content gets published. Now email marketing. Everybody thinks, I know what email is, but, but really, it's not what you do when you communicate uh, in the office or to your friends, uh, as Adam's obviously discussed uh, previously. But what you need behind the scenes to make email marketing work properly is a subscriber database to store email addresses and information about the customers. This is how you get advanced segmentation. This is how you make sure that you're sending relevant information to, relevant, uh, to the relevant subscriber. Um, it links your website to products and services, which is great. And of course, your email has to do more than just, just contain some text. You want custom branding, custom calls to action. Um, you want to be able to control that design and layout anytime and make changes on the fly. Uh, and of course, once you've sent your email, you need to have tracking and analytics in the background so you can actually measure the effectiveness of your email campaigns. Finally, um, depending on your organization, uh, most uh, organizations use a, a CRM platform. What a CRM platform does is it connects that uh, email and CMS um, uh, a tracking of customer relationship and interaction with your tools um, to your sales and marketing teams. Um, it allows you to track sales leads and contacts and bring that information back and forth between marketing 
um, and your sales team. You maintain records of customer information, uh, contact information, communication history, sales opportunities, um, you know, where they're located, when they last purchased a, a product from you, um, when their contract may be up for renewal. All of this stuff can be stored in, uh, stored in your CRM platform and, of course, fed back into your CMS so that you end up having this seamless connection uh, of information that you can use for marketing. Again, your CRM must integrate with the other marketing tools, otherwise you're putting a big hurdle uh, in the way of your effective marketing. Now, one of the things we, we uh, although I kind of uh, dumped on traditional media uh, at the beginning of the presentation, um, you can and should use digital marketing in conjunction with your traditional marketing channels. Um, if you use a print ad, for example, you can include links to things like landing pages to track the level of interest and get an opportunity to provide more information that fits in, in an ad. So for example, you know, in your ad you have a link to www.yourcompany um, slash landing page. People who are really interested in finding out more will take the opportunity that that gives them to come into your digital marketing channels. Um, this can also be used very effectively at trade shows, events, contests. Anything that pushes customers into your digital marketing system um, gives you incredible leverage. Because once you've used things like online forms to collect information about those customers, you can then draw them into your email communications program, you can draw them into more personalization of the messaging, and you can start really marketing to them in a more effective way. One of the huge uh, advantages of this integration is cost. You know, traditional marketing, driving people into your digital ecosystem, uh, will reduce your overall cost to convert them from a prospect into a buying customer because you can use digital marketing to carry them through the journey. Once customers are connected digitally, you can contact them as often as you want, and again, it's almost cost free. So why wouldn't you want this? You know, bring down your cost of acquisition. And again, you can nurture customer relationships and draw them deeper into your sales cycle by communicating with them regularly and with relevant information until they're ready to buy. I want to talk a little bit about something you're probably already using, um, but you know may not be aware, uh, and, and how it reflects on that that CMS CRM uh, email tool provider uh, space. So what what I want to talk about is software as a service. So you know whether you know it or not, you're probably already using it. Uh, Google's entire suite is all software as a service. Salesforce software as a service. Uh, Akamai. There's a, a ton of tools that are available as um, an alternate method of delivering software. And what's important is that this method shapes and molds the way that buyers interact with the software that they're using and how those software providers think about their clients. So the SaaS model is based on licensing rather than on a, on a purchase. So you, you, know, you have flexibility to, to change that you don't find in traditional or, or enterprise installation. Um, you know, if you don't like the way a SaaS product is working, you should be able to change your license, change the functionality. SaaS is accessible anywhere. You don't have to worry about virtual network passwords or access points. You log in on the web from whatever computer you like, and you get to work. The philosophical change on the vendor level, you know, and this is something that, that I mentioned both because more and more platforms are adopting it and because at Marquee, this is something that we really care about. The, the philosophical change is that this type of software delivery makes the relationship about service. You know, if you buy a copy of Photoshop, you get the manual, maybe there's a number you can call, but chances are pretty good you're gonna end up on a forum for support. With a, a SaaS engagement, your, um, your on, the ongoing revenue of the vendor is based on the satisfaction of its users. So it, it becomes about empowering the users, building experts. The, the success of a SaaS model company is your success, right, as a client. So, you know, this, this just speaks philosophically to the way that, that at Marquis specifically, but that a lot of companies uh, operate now, that it's about more than just software, that it's about service on, on top of that. So something to keep in mind when you're, when you're making your choice about what tools to engage with. And the way that a, a proper, a company that's a pro approaching this in the proper way, the way that they can provide those services is by 
integrating your content management system with their services offering. Um, so I'm going to use, I'll use Marquee as an example because obviously it's the, the business that I understand the best. Um, but you can take some of these points to be general advice as well. You know, this is what we would consider the bottom line for engaging with a content management system uh, vendor. So an integrated vendor is going to be able to provide you with strategic services tailored specifically to the software that they sell. So it's going to be a transparent process. You're going to be able to take the time to look behind the curtain and see how it all works. This turns strategy from a sort of mushy process, uh, you know, a set of documents you get at the end of an invisible process into something real and executable and repeatable, right? So if I build a strategic plan for a customer, I'm building it in the marquee software, I'm turning it over to my customer and I'm walking them through saying, this is how each step is going to work in the software that I'm an expert at and now you are too because you have the, the appropriate training and you have that support. You know, if you're engaging an organization to actually execute the campaigns for you, um, you know, writing copy, building campaign plans, launching email programs, if you don't have the resources or the expertise on your own to do that, you're going to want to use one that's as familiar with the tool set as you intend to be. Um, you know, this way, if you have questions along the way or, or you just want to replicate what's already been done, say I execute a campaign for a client in Marquee, I want them to be able to copy that campaign, change out the content, and get all of the, the advantages that I talked about before in terms of web and email for themselves, right, that flexibility. So that infrastructure is there already because we integrate the services model and the content management system together. You know, you want to consider every campaign execution that you engage a services provider for to be both a productive element of your digital marketing campaigns, but also a training exercise for you and for your users. You know, and, and to that end, support and training are often considered kind of a, a extraneous service or a, a, they're often overlooked, uh, you know, as, as being implied. But really, they shouldn't be because the quality that's available in terms of training and support can vary wildly. So when you're choosing a CMS tool and you're looking at services integration, think of support as a service in the same way you would, you know, a website designer build or any other opportunity to engage that way. You know, uh, it's, it's an integral element of your success metrics, making sure that you feel like your team is made up of power users, you know, and, and that you have all of the available tools that you need to do it yourself. So to, to go into a little bit more uh, detail on these, just some opportunities around strategic services. So you know, a good strategy obviously is the, is the starting point for every successful marketing campaign, digital or otherwise. And with a service-enriched CMS, you can really ensure that your strategy is built in at the earliest stage. Regardless of how deeply you're going to engage on a strategic level, you want the process to be running alongside your own marketing initiatives. And a flexible integration is going to ensure that the sometimes bumpy road between ideation and execution is as smooth as humanly possible. Um, some strategic services that your CMS vendor might include could be you know, content and copy strategy, so what kinds of pages to build, uh, UI and UX design, um, campaign calendaring, so knowing the best practices around when to send uh, campaigns throughout the year, uh, designing lead nurturing programs, segmentation planning, Analysis of data, uh, integrating your other channels, both at the uh, the outset or as you go. There's a lot of different ways that a, a properly executed strategy can tie directly into your content management system. So keep those in mind when you're when you're going to make those those choices. And then as far as training and support goes. You know, again, we're really proud of the, the support that we provide our customers. So we, we consider that to be the, the baseline, right? Providing phone support, web support, email support, uh, an expansive documentation library if you want to support yourself, uh, providing an integrated onboarding process for every new client. So there's from the, from the first moment that you're in touch with the sales team all the way through until you're an expert in the software, you should feel engaged. You know, there shouldn't be any point where you feel kind of let go. Um, support should be provided in-house, right? You want experts, not a call center with people reading a script. You want people who know how to use the software, who can help you and who are familiar with your specific business. And as the product improves, and you're going to get this from a SaaS model, right? As the product gets better, your users get better because of ongoing support and training for your new users. So if there's a new feature that gets created, you should expect to get training, whether it's a webinar, uh, it's direct training, whether it's an additional set of documentation, all of that stuff should go towards making sure that you are feeling the, the best trained and the most uh, prepared 
for for using that software. You know, for us, we believe that that believing in your team and and the a vendor is part of your team, right? Believing in that that team, your marketing department your vendor, all of that stuff is easier to do when you know you have experts available to answer your questions and to, to really pitch in and lend a hand when things get hectic. So uh, Paul's going to tell you a little bit about Marquee in general. I mean, I've hinted at some things, but we'll, uh, we'll leave you with some, some information about us specifically. All right. So just to conclude, if you want to find out more about us, uh, what we do, or, uh, or about Marquee in general, please visit www.marquee.com. Uh, if you'd like to contact us by email, you can either do it through info at marquee.com, or if we've convinced you that we're the absolute right solution already, um, you can write to us at sales at marquee.com. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation today, uh, and we hope you found it informative. Thank you very much.